this way for generations. Dates in the Bible don't quite match the marriage certificate. You have found us, America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. My name is Fisher, the radio root sleuth on the program where we shake your family tree and watch the nuts fall out. And this segment of our show is brought to you today by MyHeritage.com. We have one guest today for two huge segments, and I'm very excited about it. Nathan Dylan Goodwin is back on the show. He's the British author who does those genealogical crime thrillers. We had him on, I think it was earlier this year, late last year, somewhere in there, but he's got a new one out. It's called The Spyglass File, and you're going to like it, and you're going to want to hear what Nathan has to say about it, how he wrote it, and how he went about the research on that. And then after that, we're going to keep Nathan on, and he's going to tell us about things we don't know about British research, maybe some free websites that we might benefit from. So stick around for that. But right now, let's head off to Beantown for my good friend, David Allen Lambert, the chief genealogist for the New England Historic Genealogical Society and AmericanAncestors.org. How are you, David? I am doing wonderful here in Beantown, and I want to let you know that I am happy to announce I am now the proud parent of a 21-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> yes. My daughter Brenda's birthday was this week and we celebrated. So now I have one adult through the gauntlet of life and mm-hmm. now I've got No, this child just means you, you this just means you're very old, David. I'm sorry. Hey, I I <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> uh, I found a great item on eBay this past week and picked it up for $10. It was a receipt from 1850 for a shipment of tobacco up to Maine on a steamship. Mm -hmm. And the steamship was named the T.F. Secor. It was built by the company that was owned by T.F. Secor in New York. And he was my great-great-grandfather's brother. He's my (gasps) great-great-grand-uncle. So I have a receipt from the steamship named after my great-great-grand-uncle. That's amazing. Extreme Jeans listeners, if you have anything by that steamship name, contact Mr. (laughs) Fisher. He wants to know. How about that news about two daddies and one mom in the news. Uh, it's yes. quite fascinating. And we're talking DNA here. Uh, we are, and it's amazing because I can't conceive how the genealogy chart's going to work. Right. Three parents, six grandparents, 12 great-grandparents, 24 great I mean, it's, right. um, it's going to be interesting, but this is probably the first of many Jordanian parents who went to Mexico. American doctors helped in essentially replacing part of the DNA that was causing a genetic mutation that caused four miscarriages with the family. So this is uh, amazing. Well, congratulations to the family, two dads. Yes, and and then the other dad basically replaced the mom's flawed DNA. So the question is, are we going to be starting to use a third party's DNA to replace bad DNA that would come within the family? Unbelievable. Ah, it really is this amazing science. Heading on to my side of the world here, we have an Ellis Island park ranger of 20 years, Danelle Simonelli. She has actually discovered where she's worked was where her grandparents came in from Italy. And so she's got a closer connection, which is allowing her to use her interpretation of Ellis Island on a personal level. So congratulations and keep on digging. That's great. Exciting news for genetic genealogists out there. 23andMe is now offering, again, their $99 genetic test. This is the one that will just search the ancestry portion of your autosomal, and I give you the health results, but that's $99, and that leads me to thanking Blaine Bettinger for sending me both his books. I'm going to be reviewing and talking about them in an upcoming episode of Extreme Genes. Blaine is a great, accomplished genetic genealogist, and his books are probably something all should read. Getting to older news, let Let's talk about the Iceman ah, again. Otzi. Right? Yes. Well, they're finding out now that the axe that was made out of copper that he had may have not had an alpine origin. It may actually be from central Italy. And so now they're looking what? at – who murdered him? You know, I mean, uh, is it the mafia? I mean, let's think about this. I mean, the Central Italy, murdered man found mm-hmm. in the Alps. Was this the earliest history of, uh, of organized hit. crime? Of a hit, yeah. Exactly. So that's a, a fun story. Obviously, the, the 25th anniversary of finding Otzi and how much he's actually told us. Digging further into history, a little bit more recent, 170 years ago was the Mexican War, and they have found in recent years remains 
means it may belong to Tennessee soldiers killed during the war. These Tennessee soldiers are being returned back to the United States for burial. Wow. And, and it's exciting because FGS, as you know, is doing the project where they're looking to put a database up like the National Parks did for the Civil War, but for Mexican War. I actually volunteered to do the sole unit for Massachusetts. We had one regiment from Massachusetts. I went this week, copied all the muster rolls, and now I'm typing them. They're becoming like old friends to me. <laughs> Isn't that fun? It really is. And I find that as I adopt these military stories, this leads me to my tip for the week. Muster up your fellow veterans and organize them. Maybe you know where your ancestor is from a particular war and you know what regiment he's in. Why don't you search for the soldiers he served with or the people that were on the crew on the ship he was on and find them on, say, for instance, find a grave. Create a virtual cemetery and muster them all together. It will help you with your research. So you'd have a virtual muster roll. Exactly. I love so that, that. Yeah, it's kind of fun. I mean, that technology has helped us gather up so much more than just the index cards we used years ago, hasn't right. it, Fish? Yeah, absolutely <laughs> right. Okay, well, NEHGS every week has a guest user database on AmericanAncestors.org, and this week we're announcing that we have the births and christenings for California from the 1800s right down to 1995. So check that out on AmericanAncestors.org. Well, that's all I have to report this week, but I'll be checking back with you next week, so stay tuned. All right, thanks so much, David. Talk to you next week. Very good. Talk to you soon. Hey, and just a reminder, if you haven't done it yet, go to ExtremeGenes.com and get yourself signed up for our Extreme Genes newsletter that comes out free every Monday. It's called The Weekly Genie, and you can find all kinds of articles there, links to great interviews from the entire archive of Extreme Genes, and links to great stories that are going on as well. So go to ExtremeGenes.com. You can get signed up there or on Facebook. And coming up for you next, we're going to talk to the British author Nathan Dylan Goodwin. We've had him on the show before. He's a great author of the genealogical crime thriller series, and his latest one is called The Spyglass File. It's about Morton Therese the genealogical researcher, a guy who was always getting into trouble for one thing or another for something that happened centuries ago. Then Nathan will talk to us about British genealogy and what you might not know about it. It all starts in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. When someone asks what is forever.com, I tell them it's a new kind of digital storage, like for your photos and documents and all the family memories. And they always shoot back with, well, that's not a very new thing. There's Facebook Shutterfly Flicker. Then I say, oh, but on forever, you own all your content. There's no third party ads and it's guaranteed for your lifetime plus 100 years. Do the others do that? Okay, so like I said, forever.com, a new kind of digital storage. You are the chief memory officer of your family. You get that frantic phone call about the reunion in two days and they need the slideshow. And you're ready because you use forever.com. Photos, news clippings, heck, you automatically upload the photos on your cell phone every day. You have everything digitally stored and organized where you can share it privately with your friends and family. No ads and it's permanent, guaranteed for generations. Yes, you are the chief memory officer and you have forever.com. Legacy Tree Genealogists is a proud sponsor of Extreme Genes. Based in Salt Lake City, Utah, near the world's largest family history library, we've been working with genealogists all over the globe since 2004 to track down records, find your ancestors, and the stories that bring your legacy to life. We also analyze DNA test results, help you join lineage societies, and find missing cousins or heirs to property. Legacy Tree is the recommended research partner of MyHeritage.com and is the world's highest client-rated genealogy firm. Call us toll-free at 1-800-818-1476. Call now or register online to get a free estimate. Learn from our free genealogy tips on our blog at LegacyTree.com slash blog. Even experienced researchers can benefit from our proven and experienced staff of specialists who can bring new approaches to old problems. Legacy Tree Genealogists. We do the research. You enjoy the discoveries. LegacyTree.com. 
Did you know that Family Search Family Tree is available through a powerful new mobile app experience? That's right. Now you can view, edit, and even add information to ancestors in your family tree whenever and wherever you are. You no longer need to wait to get home or make a date with your computer to view or update your family tree. You can add details to your tree when visiting with family or when capturing details from a trip to the cemetery. You can share new family history discoveries from classroom settings. You can even make the most of your time when waiting for doctor appointments or car repairs. Get started today by downloading the free Family Search Family Tree app to your Apple or Android device. Visit familysearch.org/treeapp to get the Family Tree app for free. Exploring and expanding your family tree has never been more convenient. Visit familysearch.org/treeapp to download the Family Search Family Tree mobile app today. And welcome back to Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show and ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth. And oh, I can't believe it's been probably almost a year since we last talked to my next guest, Nathan Dylan Goodwin. He's uh, a British author of a series of genealogical crime mysteries about his forensic genealogist, Morton Ferrier. And he's come out with his fourth book. It's called The Spyglass File. And as is typical, I devoured it in like a day. And it's great to have you back on the show, Nathan. How are you? Thank you. Yeah, it's good to be back on the show. Yes, I'm very well. Thank you very much. You know, you're going to have a problem at some point trying to explain to people how this Morton Ferrier could have so many things happen to him for things that happened long ago. I know it's a, it's a tricky one, but at the beginning, I kind of was a bit stuck and thinking, but why? You know, and it kind of kept coming back down to someone was born illegitimately and they wanted to cover it up. And I thought, no, I've got to think of some bigger ideas than that and actually it's uh, it's been okay i've come up with a few good ones and so with the spyglass file it's quite a good reason and i've got ideas for future books so i'm, I'm okay for a while yet <laughs> <laughs> well first of all let's tell people where they can get it before we go any further so it's available um in paperback and on kindle so amazon is the most obvious one but i think you can also get it from your barnes and noble stores and some of your other book retailers but amazon would be the most obvious one to go to and of course you you can get it electronically and you can get it yes. physically as well. And it's a, it's a lovely yeah. cover. So the way that Nathan works is basically this. He's got all these genealogical circumstances back there, historical things. Many of them, I would assume, Nathan, well, most of them you can actually find on record, correct? Yes. I, I mean, in this book and in all the other books, the, the records that Morton uses to help him solve the crime or the, the research that he's conducted into the past, they're all real records. So they do have fictitious content. And occasionally he gets access to them a bit quicker than regular genealogists might. But yeah, they're all real documents, but with fictional content. Well, that's not any different than any other detective show, is it? They solve murders in like two, three days. Yes, right? exactly. <laughs> <laughs> now, in this case, of course, he's a professional genealogist. He gets hired by people. He goes out to try to solve their problem and winds up in the middle of a modern day crime. And he, he's done this now four times with this one, the spyglass file. So what I really like about this, Nathan, is I'm a, a fanatic about World War II and the various stories that come out of that and, and the novels as well. But I don't think I've ever had a novel that really puts you in the middle of of uh, World War II and a lifestyle of how people had to live, young people who were involved in trying to crack German codes and, and dealing with the regular loss of pilots who were making their sorties into Europe at the time, as this book does. It's incredible that way. Did you have some kind of family connection to World War II yourself? Well, funnily enough, I did. The, this book kind of came about very loosely based on a real story. Basically, last July, I discovered that my dad had an illegitimate sister born during the Second World War. And it was at the time when my grandfather was prisoner of war in Thailand. And so he wasn't the baby's father. 
so my grandmother was basically forced to give this baby up for adoption. And as far as anyone in the family was concerned, including the baby that was born, there was no connection ever made. The baby was never told until about 2006 she discovered that she was adopted. Nobody in our family knew. I could really have kicked myself, actually, because if I just run a basic search in the index, birth indexes, I would have found that my dad had an older sister but you you don't think do you just, no. you I just didn't think to question it it's just I always knew my dad there was my dad and he had two younger sisters but I didn't ever think to run a search but if I had done then I would have found this other child so yes it's based loosely on a real story in my family tree and the rest of it just took uh, an awful lot of research visiting museums and aerodromes and libraries and uh, a lot of reading and uh, research into the period well I can't even imagine I mean not only the period but the places as well by the White Cliffs of Dover that so many of us are, are familiar with, <laughs> the, the air base that was there and, and a little house that was used for code breaking. And, and you ha obviously had to visit those places and get the stories behind them. Yes, yes. I visited all the places and they're all real places. So the main character in the past part called Elsie Finch, she's working for the Women's Auxiliary Air Force in their Y service department, which was listening in. She was bilingual, so she could speak English and German. And so she would be listening in. Uh, in this little house up in Hawkins near the aerodrome, listening to the German pilots coming over, and they would record the conversations that they were hearing, which were, first of all, they were obviously in German, but they were also in code. So they would have to write down the exact German that they were hearing. They would then have to write down the English translation and then have to write down what the actual meaning was. So they would say things like, in German, they would say, I'm thirsty which would mean that they were low on fuel. And so they would have to be doing all this really, really quickly and hearing whole conversations. And it was a really important part of the uh, the war effort, actually, because they would then have to make operational decisions based on that. So they would be phoning immediately to the, the aerodrome and they would be getting the British planes up into the air to then try to fight against the, the Luftwaffe pilots. And then the, the information would be passed to Bletchley Park that lots of people have heard of yes for, for deeper analysis and further analysis the real places that, that are still around today and and so i visited them and i mean some of them are private residents so i haven't done any more than visit them from the outside you guys don't have a habit of getting rid of old houses like we do right <laughs> no, things sure. for a long long time <laughs> well and what i like about this too is it really gets into the human side of it you know the fact that you just don't know if you're going to have it tomorrow and people are falling in love, and obviously they behave often in a way they wouldn't during hmm. regular peacetime. And these are probably things you drew from with the story of this new aunt that you recently discovered, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah, she's lovely, really lovely. And I, you know, I wish I had met her a long time ago. My dad, unfortunately, died in 2006, the very year that she discovered. Well, that was the year, in fact, she didn't discover she was adopted in 2006. That was when she went to look for her birth certificate and couldn't find it. So then she then started to do some research into herself and then found a year later her name in the adoption register. But she, yeah, she kind of said, and we as a family think that probably my grandmother just was acting in a way that she wouldn't necessarily have done otherwise just because of the war situation. I mean, she was told that her husband was missing, presumed dead in 1942, and she didn't hear a single word more until a whole year later, 10 days before my aunt, my new aunt, was uh, was born. So she didn't know if he was dead or if he was alive or, you know, what had happened to him. And I think for everybody, civilians, people working in the military for the, for the Women's Auxiliary Air Force pilots, they just didn't know what tomorrow was going to bring for them. And I think people did behave differently. Absolutely. Have you ever thought yourself, you know, what would I have done in this situation? Yeah, it's a funny thing, isn't it? I Yeah, I do. And I think, you know, would because you, you kind of look in hindsight, don't you, back on history and you think, what would I have done? Which services would I have joined up or what would I have done? You really can't know, can you? But, no. Great Britain was at much greater peril than the United States, so I think mm. the way you would think about it might be entirely different than the way we might think about that. I will tell you that as I read the book, I, I started thinking, now my DNA test, do, do I find matches that show my dad was my dad? You know, things like this. <laughs> and, and I had to actually think through it. And I, oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. We've got some from, from his mother's side, and obviously, so yes, we're good. And I, I was thinking who might you know, have to get tested to to assure those things. So it's it's kind of funny. It does leave you a little edgy sometimes going, hmm, how is it this going to yes. work out? Yeah. So what has your aunt thought of this book? Obviously, you had her in mind as you did it. Has she read it? 
I did. And I was completely honest with her right at the beginning and said I'd really like to, um, you know, base a book on this. And she'd read some of the other ones and she was really kind and, and agreed to it. And she let me look through all of her adoption papers which, is, you know, there's a huge amount of paperwork and documentation sure. and letters from my grandmother's father, who was kind of intervening a bit and kind of say, we need to hurry this up and et cetera. But all these documents, because they're related to adoption, they're totally not open documents. Only the person it concerns can access them. And even then it's through lots of letters and emails and counselling and it's very complicated. So she was very kind to let me see the type of documents that are available there. Then I got it set about writing the book and she was basically the first proofreader of the book so sure. I thought, you know she needs to make sure she's happy with with everything going out because it is based loosely on my grandmother's story but also it's I tried to not make it her story if you know what I mean so that it was a separate fictional person but with a loose basis in real life and she proofread it and she really really enjoyed it and she's been very supportive since you know like I've, I've written a blog about my grandmother's story in the process and again you know I made sure she approved it all because it's it's about her kind of personal kind of yeah very personal yeah sure you know it's hard enough to write a story like this fictionally have you ever been tempted to actually do a true to life version of the story yeah I, I have been but I kind of think really that perhaps my aunt Pauline should do it I was encouraging at the beginning of her doing it herself but if she doesn't then it's certainly something I would consider I have done non-fiction books before so Yes, it's something I would consider. But at the moment, Morton is taking up all my writing time. <laughs> <laughs> the book is The Spyglass File, a genealogical crime mystery with Morton Ferrier, the forensic genealogist. It's a great book. Once again, a great read, an easy read. I got it done, devoured in one Saturday afternoon, Nathan. So I appreciate that because it's, <laughs> it's hard to find time to read books sometimes. And I look forward to your next one. Once again, people can get it at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and... And where yep. else? If you just go to my website, which is NathanDillonGoodwin.com, wherever you're living, there are links there to buy it in Canada, in America, in Germany, in England. So um, that's a good starting point. There's more information on there. There's also links to a Pinterest page where I've put photos of the buildings and places and some of the research used and the blog that I mentioned. So that's probably a good starting point. Otherwise, yeah, it'd be Amazon would be the next one. All right. And this segment has been brought to you by FamilySearch.org. And uh, Nathan, can you stick around a bit? We want to get a little advice from you about British genealogy, because I think you have a pretty good background in that. <laughs> yes, I'd be happy to offer my advice. <laughs> All right. Coming up in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Scientific studies have proven that youth who know even a little bit about their family history perform better academically and have a greater sense of personal confidence and stability. Genealogy is its own incredible superpower that arms our children with super strength. But how do you get your child or grandchild interested in studying their family history? That kind of stuff is just for grandmas, right? Not anymore. ZapTheGrandmaGap.com leaps the generation gap in a single bound. Author Janet Havorka provides you with useful and timely advice on helping the young people in your life become engaged in their own family history. Janet has an entire collection of books to inspire the young and the young at heart in fun, interactive ways. She also offers creative tips and advice on her blog and in her free weekly newsletter. Stop by ZapTheGrandmaGap.com today to sign up for Janet's free email newsletter with 52 weeks of easy tips, free downloads, and order your set of resource books and workbooks. Looking for an easy way to show off your family history and share it with your family? Family Chart Masters offers beautiful custom pedigree art pieces and inexpensive family reunion draft charts in any design or size that fits your needs. With a free consultation at FamilyChartMasters.com, you can get started creating a new family masterpiece. Family Chart Masters has over 11 years of experience in creating and printing family charts. They can print any style genealogy chart from any genealogy file and can create exactly what you're looking for. You'll work with a specialized and talented consultant whose goal is to make you happy. Decorative charts make fantastic gifts for all occasions. And with Family Chart Master's option of ordering duplicate charts at half price along with your original purchase at full price, you can afford to give a family heirloom to each member of your family. 
Contact Family Chartmasters today at FamilyChartmasters.com for your free consultation. Family Chartmasters will give the greatest care to your family history. And we are back. Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show and ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here. I am your radio root sleuth. And we're continuing our conversation with Nathan Dylan Goodwin, the English author. He's the author of The Spyglass File, a genealogical crime mystery featuring once again the forensic genealogist Morton Ferrier, a World War II thing. And a great read. I went through it very quickly. And since we had you on the line, Nathan, and you are kind of the man behind Morton Ferrier, I thought we'd pick your brains about some things about English research that maybe we here in America don't know too much about. Now, we know the Irish have just released a treasure trove of records. We just announced that a couple of weeks ago, and everybody's excited about that. What are we missing that we should be getting from your government? Yes, that's a very good question. Yeah, the Irish records are amazing release of documents. I mean, really, we should have the English version of that. At the moment, you don't have the civil records available at all. All you have online, if you go through uh, Ancestry, all you've got is the indexes to births, marriages and deaths right. since 1837. And so you can sometimes you can work out, yes, that's my ancestor's birth record if they've got a peculiar name or something but the content of it it's all it simply is is their name and a confirmation that they were born right um, and, and the quarter right i mean it doesn't even give the, you the, the month yeah it's not even the month no and it's <laughs> and it's a, the yeah and it's the the kind of the borough it's not even the town so you might sometimes overlook something because it's the it looks like it's the wrong place but actually it's the borough it's under consultation at the moment and there's a hope that the english records will go the same way particularly historic ones kind of ones that are uh, 100 years old or older because they really should be available online for free at the moment it's nine pound 25 per certificate and so i've got right. thousands of pounds worth of yeah. certificates sitting in my office oh. um I hope it will happen at some point. I, I think it needs to go on. It's under consultation, so let, let's hope. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, I think the Irish government, their motivation was simply this. They wanted more tourists. So I can't yeah. imagine the English government's looking at this going, oh, we don't need any more tourists. We don't need these people coming here. <laughs> right? I mean, we come, we leave could... money, and we leave. <laughs> what, yeah. What's wrong with that? <laughs> it could be as well. Probably it's also a, a very good money maker for them. If, it, if they're making money, you know, nine pound twenty-five per certificate, they're probably thinking, no, we don't want it online for free. But I don't know. It would also take the pressure off of record offices as well a little bit sure. because it's much more accessible, obviously, for overseas researchers. You know, you simply can't go to a record office to to get that record for free. You've got to order it online and pay that money. So sure, we shall see. Well, you know, I was just thinking about something that came to mind, as you mentioned, this idea that the indexes we see don't necessarily tell us where we should look. There have got to be a lot of parishes within these boroughs, right? There are, yeah. It varies. Sometimes it's just a, just a handful, but other times, particularly in the area I'm in, in Kent and Sussex, down in the south of England, you get, you know, lots and lots of villages, some really, really tiny with just a you know, small population, and they're, they're then fed into the local borough. You can't know things from the index. You know, you need to have that certificate, and so you have to pay for it, really. So it's a shame. Yeah, that's the issue. So we don't know what we don't know, right, Nathan? <laughs> Tell right. us what we don't know that we should know. Um, well, I mean, my starting point for research over here would be the obvious websites that you would have access to. Beyond that, I would be then looking at things like the British Newspaper Archive. That's online. Um, it's quite an expensive subscription service, or there's a one-off fee. But basically, you can go onto their website, which is BritishNewspaperArchive.co.uk, and that's a really another really good resource if your ancestors made the news, because it's not just the big national newspapers; it's also more and more of the local regional newspapers are going online as well. So, if your ancestors came from a small town and they're sometimes they're their marriage or their death and obituary might be mentioned. So that's one good starting point. Another one that I use quite often, particularly as Ancestry, uh, the death, birth and marriage indexes, they stop around 2007. So if I'm looking for someone who was born, married or died since then, um, you kind of run out of places to look. So I go to the government uh, wills um, database, which is at gov.uk 
uh, slash search dash will dash probate. And basically you can put into there a search criteria for a person you're looking for and that will come up with if they've left a will uh, admittedly then that will come up on there and so that can help you identify that a relative has died and if you want to pay the £10 fee you can then order their will it could then give you wealth information of addresses and children and all sorts of information so that's another one I would be looking at now let me ask you this Definitely. London research I mean there, there were obviously millions of people in London and still are many who came here and they would have been I would say from the lower classes and do we have newspapers from London that talk about the obituaries and the marriages of the lower classes, the more common people? Not really. My relatives came from London and they were lower class. And no, I have to say, I've looked and looked and looked um, and I've been to the actual archives as well and looked in the local papers. I'm not just looking at it online and thinking perhaps there's, there are gaps there or they haven't been digitized. The lower classes, they just weren't um, simply because they you know, couldn't afford it. It's the same. You know, lots of my relatives were buried in pauper's graves, which is, you know, I visited the churchyard or the cemetery and there's nothing there. There's just a field. And you think, well, where are they? Mm -hmm. And they're buried three, four, five people deep. And you just don't know where they are. And even if you could identify them, it's not their own grave. It's like I say, they're sharing it with other people. And so the same thing, they just, their families couldn't afford very often to pay the obituary newspaper fees or the, to put the marriage information in there. So unfortunately, if you're talking about the lower classes, that probably isn't a good resource, really. Then you're going to have to go down the route of looking at things like poor rates. And for things like that, you're going to have to contact the local record offices, which they they quite often wow. um, if you email them with a specific inquiry they quite often will do that for you for free because i mean even me being based in england if i've got a relative who died or i'm looking for information for example further up north or even in london i contact the record office with the specific inquiry and they search their archives usually if it's specific enough, they'll do it for free and then send you the information. Yes. I had somebody who died in the war. He was working for the, the local council and clearing a bombed house and the house fell on him and he died. And his obituary was in the newspaper and I wrote Croydon Library and they looked at the newspaper for the date and they sent me a copy of the obituary. So, and we do that commonly here as well. And a lot of county libraries yeah. are terrific at uh, responding free to these inquiries, especially if you give them a little bit of time, you know? Yes. Be Nice, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes. All yeah. right. What else don't we know that we should know? So I think, again, it would be to join. If you know lots of your relatives came from one particular parish, then it would be to join. I don't know if you have the same thing in America, but there are very often family history societies for that particular county. Oh, so yes. I've got relatives that come from Norfolk, for example. And so I've joined Norfolk Family History Society. And obviously you get the journal sent to you through the post with information and things. And the lots of other counties are doing the same thing. They digitise in more and more of their records online. I don't have to go to Norfolk. I can just sit at home on my computer with my login details and I can go on and they've digitised lots of their baptisms, marriages and burials. So that's another really good resource. So if you know your relatives come from a particular zone, I would definitely go to that Family History Society and see what they've got because that's where a lot of the information is within the, the Family History Societies for that county. Well, I wish we could spend a lot more time, Nathan. It has been a blast chatting with you again. He's the author of The Spyglass File, a genealogical crime mystery about Morton Ferrier, the forensic genealogist. It's the fourth in his series, and you can get it on Amazon. You can get it at Barnes & Noble and all the other places Nathan mentioned earlier. Good luck with the book, Nathan, and thanks for Thank the information. You Thank you. You're welcome. And this segment's been brought to you by LegacyTree.com. And coming up next, we'll talk to Tom Perry about preservation. He'll be answering a listener email about a fading photograph on a dish. <laughs> How can she save it? Tom will have some advice coming up for her next in three minutes on Extreme Genes.
know, everybody needs a place of their own to plant their family tree, preferably one that no one else can mess with and only you can control. That perfect place is Roots Magic. Roots Magic has been a family history standard for years, and now Roots Magic 7 is on the market. It's an award-winning genealogical software program which makes researching, organizing, and sharing your family history easy. You can start from scratch or import data from other software or even family search. Roots Magic also automatically finds records relating to your ancestors from MyHeritage, Family Search, and soon Ancestry and Find My Past. You can use it to create beautiful charts, reports, and books. And have you ever thought about making your own family history website? Roots Magic can make that happen too. And of course, there are free videos, guides, and technical support to help you along. Isn't it about time you planted your family tree? Whether you're a beginning genie or experienced professional, Roots Magic is the perfect tool for you. Well, Genies, my personal family history researcher who sends me new information day and night has sent me some incredible new records and newspaper stories lately. Hi, it's Fisher, and the name of that researcher, by the way, is MyHeritage.com. It's the hardest working service in genealogy, looking for records of your family 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Yes, even while you're sleeping. How does it work? MyHeritage uses hundreds of algorithms to match your ancestors to over 5 billion records from around the world. World, and with 97% accuracy. That means no more wasting time figuring out whether or not a match really is a match. I hear from listeners all the time who are shocked with how much information is accurately found and then passed along. And now my heritage will translate your ancestors' names into English or any other language you like from foreign records. In fact, it works with over 40 languages. No one else does this. Whether you're a beginner or seasoned researcher, you need MyHeritage.com. Extreme Genes is sponsored in part by 23andMe.com, a personalized genetic service that helps you understand what your 23 pairs of chromosomes, your DNA, say about you. 23andMe.com gives you a snapshot view of your DNA with more than 60 detailed reports on your health, traits, and ancestry, plus tools to explore and compare your DNA with family and friends. 23andMe.com is the first and only genetic service available directly to you that includes reports that meet FDA standards. Here's how it works. Order your DNA kit from 23andMe.com. Provide your saliva sample from home and mail it back to a CLIA certified lab. Then you'll be notified when your reports are ready online. You'll also receive ongoing reports as new genetic discoveries are made and as 23andMe.com is able to clear new reports through the FDA. See why more than 1 million people are experiencing their genetics with 23andMe.com. Order your DNA kit today at 23andMe.com. And it is preservation time at Extreme Genes, America's family history show at ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth with Tom Perry from TMCPlace.com. Hello, Tom. Hello. And this segment is brought to you by Forever.com. And I love it when we get your emails with your questions. This one from Heather Shoney. She said, Tom, my husband and I honeymooned in Taiwan 45 years ago. We bought pictures of us that a photographer took and put on decorative saucers. The photos are deteriorating and becoming cracked. Is there some way that the photos can be restored or preserved on the plates? Thanks for your help. Wow, what a question. That is, that's an awesome question, and I don't think we've ever had that before, but it's you no. know, very timely. Yes. So with the holidays coming up and everything, if you want to get that restored for you know family and friends, there's several different ways you can do it, and of course, there's several different price points. The most economical way to do it would be to scan the plate, and a perfect thing to scan this plate in would be shot box, which we talked about last week. Right. Because if you scan it at a high DPI with either your phone, your Nikon, whatever you want to use— then you can go in and edit it. If that's over your head, you can send it to us or any other person that does restoration, and we can recreate the photo for you. And then there's a lot of novelty places all across the country that will take photographs and put them on saucers, put them on plates, cups, mugs, all kinds of different things. And so that way you'd be recreating it. It'd be a whole new thing if that's what's important to you. And, of course, the color could be fixed as well, because I would imagine with it fading away, you can darken it again and fill in all the cracks. That'd be fun. Oh, absolutely. And depending how faded the picture is, if it's like you can't tell the colors anymore, 
then whether we do it or whoever you have do it, if you can get another photo that maybe you took on your honeymoon that you're in the same clothes so they can see what the original colors were, then they can make it look exactly like it was. Wow. If that's not available, then just kind of write, this is kind of a lemon yellow dress he had on a, you know, a chartreuse tie or whatever. And then we can go in and totally recreate the whole thing for you. As I mentioned, that's probably going to be the most economical way to do it. If you're really into that plate and the heirloom and you really want to restore it the way it is, there's a lot of restoration places that can refer you to somebody that actually does hand painting. And what they would do is they would go recreate it. They'd basically repaint your photo and then refire it and then seal it again. And you'd have your plate back. However, you know, wow. you're looking at a lot of money to do that. <laughs> I would say. It's just like having a special mural done. But, you know, that's a great question. And, you know, whether it's a plate or anything else like that, there's always options. And I tell people over and over again. If you have something that's old like that, that's an heirloom, don't throw it away thinking, oh, it just looks so bad, nobody will enjoy it. There's always ways to restore things. So, Tom, what if I had a picture of an ancestor from the 19th century, and I wanted to put their picture on a plate or a dish or something and make it look old? Is that doable? Oh, absolutely. There's a lot of ceramic dealers out there that will actually take any kind of a photograph and put it on a plate like you mentioned, it could be on a mug. And one thing that's really neat, if you want to personalize your kitchen, if you're redoing your backsplash, you can actually get those little square tiles or even subway tiles, and you can have a picture put on them. So even if you have a picture that's not that old, that's you, you can go and make it sepia tone, or you can go and make it over magenta like it's kind of faded, or just a nice family picture and make a subway tile and put it right there in your backsplash. And it's always there to be a conversation piece. You can actually almost have like a genealogy tree of, you know, grandma and grandpa and then your parents and then the kids. There's so many different options you can do with this. And with the holidays coming up, you know, this would be a great gift for somebody, for somebody in your sure. family. So one thing that's really, really nice, like I say, and you mentioned, if you have a picture that's not that old, go in and make it look old. You know, put scratches in it, just give sure. it some character and make a plate and hang it up there and... They'll say, wow, you sure look like your great-grandparents. Oh, well, that's actually me. <laughs> well, there are actually filters out there that will make things look antiqued. Oh, absolutely. For, for any kind of photograph. Absolutely. Photoshop and Digital Darkroom have all kinds of filters. You can really do some fun stuff for holiday gifts. All right. We're getting some great questions here from your emails. We've got another one coming up for you in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Looking for an easy way to show off your family history and share it with your family? Family Chart Masters offers beautiful custom pedigree art pieces and inexpensive family reunion draft charts in any design or size that fits your needs. With a free consultation at FamilyChartMasters.com, you can get started creating a new family masterpiece. Family Chart Masters has over 11 years of experience in creating and printing family charts. They can print any style of genealogy chart from any genealogy file and can create exactly what you're looking for. You'll work with a specialized and talented consultant whose goal is to make you happy. Decorative charts make fantastic gifts for all occasions. And with Family Chart Master's option of ordering duplicate charts at half price along with your original purchase at full price, you can afford to give a family heirloom to each member of your family. Contact Family Chart Masters today at FamilyChartMasters.com for your free consultation. Family Chart Masters will give the greatest care to your family history. When was the last time you heard your grandmother's voice or saw your family enjoying life back in the 1950s or 60s? If the reason is you haven't known what to do with your old recordings, videos, and films, here's your answer. The Multimedia Center in Salt Lake City. We brought in a video project to the Multimedia Center, and overnight, they duplicated it to DVD so we could meet our deadline. The Multimedia Center, 2870 East, 3300 South, Salt Lake City. Open Monday through Friday, 10 to 6. Call 801-483-1717 or go to Transfer Duplication. Com. Extreme Genes is sponsored in part by 23andMe.com, a personalized genetic service that helps you understand what your 23 pairs of chromosomes, your DNA, say about you. 23andMe.com gives you a snapshot view of your DNA with more than 60 detailed reports on your health, traits, and ancestry, plus tools to explore and compare your DNA with family and friends. 23andMe.com is the first and only genetic service available directly to you that includes reports that 
meet FDA standards. Here's how it works. Order your DNA kit from 23andMe.com, provide your saliva sample from home, and mail it back to a CLIA-certified lab. Then you'll be notified when your reports are ready online. You'll also receive ongoing reports as new genetic discoveries are made and as 23andMe.com is able to clear new reports through the FDA. See why more than 1 million people are experiencing their genetics with 23andMe.com. Order your DNA kit today at 23andMe.com. We are back. Final segment of Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show and ExtremeGenes.com. We're talking preservation with Tom Perry. Talking about putting photographs and saucers and, and on tiles and backsplashes. And while we were off air there, Tom, you had another idea. Oh, yeah. This one is great. You know how everybody marks a special event when they put a cornerstone in a building? Well, there's something that you guys can do. It's not that expensive. As long as you have a good stone cutter in your area and any place that's got a cemetery has got to have a stone cutter close by, just pick out a rock, whether you like granite, sandstone, you know, any kind of stone that you like. They'll cut off one side of it, make it nice and smooth, then put a polyester coating on it. And then they can put your full color photo, a black and white photo. You can make it look old fashioned. You can even put the year you made it, your family name engraved right into the rock. Put wow. it your front porch. And it looks so cool and it's so awesome. And then if you ever do move, you can take it with you. I love that. The thing that would be really bad, though, is if some prankster came along and took it. What are they going to do with that? Yeah, hook up a couple of D batteries and a little bit of wire. I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> All right. We got another email, and this one is from Amanda Munez. And she says, Tom, can you update film DSLR cameras to digital? Wow, that's a question. Could you take a film camera, Tom, and convert it into a digital camera? And why would you want to do that? Oh, Absolutely. Back in the days when digital cameras were first coming out, people had, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars invested into lenses, into camera bodies. And so they would go and buy a 35 millimeter CMOS chip, which were very expensive at the time, so that the lenses would work properly on them. And even though they did that, it was very, very expensive. But now the new technology has actually caught up to those old cameras. So you can go and buy good quality Canon and Nikon bodies now that were made as digital cameras and still use your old lenses on them. Wow. There's different ways you can do it, but that's definitely what I would do. I would invest in a new camera, and you can always call bhphoto.com, go to their website, and they can answer a lot of those questions for you. If you are really you know, set on you want to put a CMOS chip or another kind of chip in your camera, they could direct you of what's the best way to do it, and they can also tell you of the different options that are available now to just you know, convert your lenses over to a new camera. And that's what I would do. It's going to save you a lot of money, but either way, I would get a hold of bhphoto.com, and they're more than happy to help you. They're great guys. Well, it sounds like uh, Amanda's just in love with this old camera and doesn't want to give it up, which makes sense, too. Oh, absolutely. And you have to do what works for you. We've talked about this so many times on the show. It's what's your end product? What do you need to do? And if that's very, very important to you, you love it, you know how it works, and you feel more comfortable with it, then that's what you need to do. You need to just upgrade it and do what's comfortable for you. All right. Here's another question. This comes from Kathy Craig. She says, Tom, what's your opinion? Do you trust Google Pictures and free Amazon photo storage? Well, you know, I don't want to really promote or diss on any product. However, I'll just tell you my experience. We love Google. In fact, our LightJar cloud is actually built on Google's backbone. I've never had a problem with Google. But like I tell you on very many segments, you want to always use two clouds if you can and make sure they're not related. For instance, there's Dropbox. Apple has their own one. Microsoft has their own one. And just make sure that they're not related. Like don't choose Light, Jar, and Google because we're both the same one. So pick different ones. Amazon Photo, I really don't know a lot about it. I have heard rumors that it's going to be sold to somebody else that just hasn't been you know, good for them. Amazon is a great place. I buy stuff off it all the time. But since it's a secondary type thing, I probably wouldn't go with them. I would go with somebody that that is their main business. That's what they do. And they've got a good reputation. And it's not going to be like a, a stepsister they sell off. All right. Great stuff, Tom. Great emails. And you can always send your emails to asktom at tmcplace.com. Thanks for coming on, bud. 
My pleasure. And this segment's been brought to you by 23andMe.com DNA and by RootsMagic.com. And that wraps up our show for this week. Thanks once again to Nathan Dillon Goodwin for dropping in and sharing with us his insight on British research and, of course, his latest novel, The Spyglass File. You can get it on Amazon.com. Hey, don't forget to go to ExtremeGenes.com and sign up for our free weekly newsletter, The Weekly Genie. Talk to you next week. And remember, as far as everyone knows, we're a nice, normal family.